Good evening, and welcome to the second fall reading of the Providence College Poetry and Fiction Series. That series is sponsored by the Department of English, and this reading is co-sponsored by English and the Women's Studies Program. Now, I would like to thank Dr. Bruce Graver, Chair of English, for his cooperation and uh, Dr. Maureen Outlaw, who is the director of the Women's Studies Program, for her cooperation as well. I have great pleasure tonight to be introducing to you Svinia Orlowski, whose latest book, Convertible Night, Flurry of Stones, reviewed by Melanie Drain, um, is just phenomenal. Uh, Zvinia is the author of three, three previous volumes, and her translation from the Ukrainian of Alexander Dovzenko's novella, The Enchanted Desna, was published by House Between the Water Press in 2006. Her other books are from Carnegie Mellon, and Convertible Night Flurry of Stones received the Sheila Martin Book Award. Um, she is a founding editor of Four Way Books, and she is, uh, has also won a Pushcart Prize for my favorite poem in Convertible Night Flurry of Stones, Nude Descending. She currently teaches at the Soltis Soltis Low Residency MFA uh, program at Pine Manor College, and she was a founding faculty member of that program. Melanie Drain tells us that according to an African proverb, quote, the blessing lies next to the wound, end quote. Orlowski's work is charged by this volatile, uncomfortable paradox in which trauma and trans transformation live side by side. And that is indeed what I find in these poems and what gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce Zvinia Orlowski. Oops. Have to see what's gonna slide toward me here. Um, can you hear me? Is this picking up okay? Um, I really like to thank Providence College, um, the writing, the English department, women's studies department. Um, Jane, for your warmth from the get-go, from the first email exchange, I am honored to be here. Um, and thank you so much for all of you for coming out on a rainy night to, to hear me read. Um, I've been invited to read for about 45 minutes, and I'm pretty good at timing myself, uh, though I may go a little under, a little over. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in between the books and the way and the, and the poems that I've um, decided to organize. And I'm going to put this down here. Um, Convertible Night, Flurry of Stones is the book that we discussed in the writing uh, class today, and I'm going to read quite a few poems of those. But I thought that I would start uh, from my first collection, A Handful of Bees, which was um, reprinted as a Carnegie Mellon classic and temporary a few years ago. And um, the first thing that I want to just say in reading these poems is that for those of you who are writers or don't yet know your writers, um, what's really important to believe is that you do have a story. And there's always a story behind the story. And all you have to do is just be really passionate about it. And don't feel like, God, what do I have to say that somebody hasn't already said a thousand times better? Because as long as you're true to your own vision, your words, um, you will bring that little extra, that individual voice that will not have been heard by a hundred thousand other people who have approached perhaps a similar subject. Um, when I first started um, writing, I didn't allow myself till my mid-30s to really take it seriously. I didn't think I had a subject. Um, I'm a first generation Ukrainian that was raised in Ohio. My parents very much wanted to duplicate um, the 
to duplicate Ukraine in Ohio. Uh, they had both been in um, work, uh, work, war camps coming out of the Ukraine um, as immigrants, and they very much wanted to hold on to everything, and they didn't, didn't allow my sister and I to speak English, which, as you can imagine, being American-born was very tough. I learned um, English just in time to enter first grade. So a handful of bees um, became my subject matter for my first book, which is being brought up first generation um, Ukrainian-American in the Midwest. So that was sort of my subject, whether or not I realized it. It took Heather McHugh to point out and say, are you crazy? You have a subject here. You just, because it's so close to you, you think it's not worthy somehow. Um, so I'll begin with those poems and then I'll move right in through Edge of House. Um, this has, this is my second book. It has a picture of my mother on the cover. And I wrote this during the time I was raising my two kids who are now freshmen and sophomore in colleges, but I literally never went past the edge of the house. Um, and then I'll stop and go into the second half of my reading and I'll end with reading maybe about three or four poems from my new manuscript, Silver Tone, that's coming out from Carnegie Mellon in 2013, and I'd also love to be able to leave, you know, a few minutes afterwards to have you ask any questions, uh, particularly women's studies class. I'm sorry I wasn't able to come to the class today. Please feel free. Any, I don't consider any question a dumb question. I would love a candid, open, warm conversation on any subject, so that's what will kind of end the evening. So I'll begin with reading from A Handful of Bees. I'm not expecting a call. I'm using this as a timer. Um, I directed my family not to call me between 7 and 8.30. So, of course, my daughter has to text me, but anyway. Okay. Morning. Nothing can disturb you now. Your sleep is the sleep of a basin of water where a woman has washed her face. This is the hour of churchyard haze, the pale pink sun around heads of saints. It must be their slow light that carries here to the grass fields, the corn fields, the hand-carved wheat. If only I could wake you, the steam in barns has started to rise, and there behind the wooden shed, the last piece of moon in an empty pail. My grandmother's side was Polish, um, so this is why this uh, poem is called Poland. The light on mother's face divides her in half. Outside, a garden hides its shadow, a summer blouse folded once. The moon guides light, thread sliding through the silver eye or the thin white blood of the Eucharist. Some eternal secret passes from hand to mouth. I want to feel the interiors of churches, breath of stone, ancestors I can't touch. So I watch the sleep of my mother's face. Um, Having had parents that and uh, grandparents that came fled from the Ukraine during an awful um, period of time, um, sort of something that I grew up with constantly was my grandmother lamenting about the ones that were left behind. Her son was sent off to Siberia. She left the country without knowing what his fate was, and a recurrent theme was those beloved that were left behind and weren't buried. And I was talking over dinner that as a child, I literally played out a lot of these things, like other kids were playing, um, you know, with their toys and skipping around. I was actually playing like records of heavy Eastern European masses and like doing little funerals for my stuffed animals and stuff so that everybody could be buried. Um, a long explanation, a shorter poem, but I wanted to give you the background. This is called Burying Dolls. The camps have long stopped burning when mother toasts my birth with cognac. 
Father films, the dog sniffs my crib. Barbie is sent to work camp in my closet. The officers like her ponytail. Ask mother. Ask her how they'll come at night to choose their women. My children will bury dolls in the garden, whisper masses for processions of shoe boxes. I'll tell them women have to look strong to stay alive. Ask grandmother. Watch her every morning lightly slap her face to give it color. And when we left the house in Ohio, the people who moved in did say, it is strange, we're putting in this garden bed and we're digging up, Barbie goes to prom, and then a few feet over, there's Ken. It's like, okay. Um, but that was my childhood, so, so be it. I'm glad I never analyzed it. I think I would have. <laughs> Some things are, be are best kept a secret until you're too old to care, I guess. Um, this is called praying. The priest taught us that blessing oneself shouldn't be like shooing flies. There is a pause at the temple of your head. You connect one shoulder to the other with a thread. Your wrist should be sincere as if conducting your body in song. On long car trips, it's OK to pray while driving, your lips parted, hands resting on the steering wheel. Soon, however, you're falling asleep. The rosary breaks and spills into trees. Feeling guilty for asking too many favors, I disguise myself by praying with my mother's accent. Maybe for her, salvation will be gentle. Dawn pausing to empty birds from a gray sack. Um, part of being sort of kept an outsider while inside America was that my, my uh, family belonged to the Ukrainian National Home, which I think a lot of uh, cultural groups have that, but it's kind of like, you know, you could do anything and everything as long as you did it at the National Home, and that's like where, you know, people got married or committed murder or whatever, but as long as it was in the National Home, it was okay. So we had these annual piano recitals, which to this day is like an anxiety, recurring anxiety dream for me, uh, because I could never play well. I played everything like a march, and um, my memory failed me, and it was just horrific. So I had to write a poem about it. It's called At the National Home. By 36, I'd outlived Mozart. My life had accumulated its own Weltschmerz, divorce, and early prognosis of blindness. Hysteria, mother said, runs in the family. All brought to the piano, prominent and open like a coffin. We were promised one genius per family. In dreams, my hand turns the page to the one song I know, Venetian boat song. Raising and pressing the foot pedal, the water laps, the gondolier dips his oar. But fingers know their limitations. At the Ukrainian national home, ankle socked and with a tight braid coiled to my head, I lost the rhapsody list might have felt. I sat numb before the backdrop of Carpathian woods. By the time I finished playing, father had excused himself, his empty seat raised. A large fan blew the scent of children waiting next in line to shame their parents, then take a bow. Um, this is an earlier poem about loss, and it's called The Cat. Sorry, I wrote down the wrong. Wrong page number for it. Hold on a second. Okay, 33. Poem for my cat. Your time was up when you crossed the road, though I wasn't sure, afraid to look. Here, Kicha. Come, Kicha. 
Ivan, my father, named you, though it would have been more fun to name you Volodymyr after the horrible who, struck down and beheaded, could still get up and run. There were many black male cats in Brunswick, Ohio, unexplained sounds, eight more lives to go around. Surely you would come back. But after that, everything that moved wasn't you. Okay, I'm going to finish um, from this book. I think this is sort of a mini memoir for me. Um, when I was in grad school, I given sent Heather McHugh a number of poems, and she wrote back, and it was just like all the way down. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm never going to graduate, and she hates my work. This is terrible. And it spun out this poem, which was a repeated sense of failure, um, which I, you know, I call my mini memoir. And it's called On Our Street. And the last line, just so you know, is in all caps and in bold. It's from an actual sign. On our street. You just don't get it, is what the school teacher meant when she told me I might enjoy repeating the class. Is what the piano teacher thought when he closed the music book and asked if I'd ever consider dancing. Is what the ballet teacher instinctively knew when she put me in the last row where I tried to hold my pose, leg dangling like a broken umbrella? Is what the GRE scorecard told me because I compared apples to oranges, said stones are to branches as leaves are to sky, one cannot touch the other? is what I meant to say to my first husband when he told me to leave. And I packed and left for good, having said nothing, and a neighbor waved as I pulled up to the sign, deaf child, slow, blind child. A um, couple of decades uh, ago, I, I think this is before your old time, your time, but there was, um, I mean, they still do the makeovers in magazines, you know, the before and after, although I think to a lesser extent, but that used to be huge. Um, and also, you know, saying what kind of season you were. Do you remember that? That was very popular. People would be like, oh, you know, I'm a winter, and I look good in bright pinks, and I'm a summer, and I look good. So that... Um, this is sort of a response poem to that, and it's called To Our Cosmeticians, and it's in four short sections. One, you want us to believe there are only two kinds of women, the before and the after. In the before woman's life, it's always raining. If you blow on her, a parachute desperately opens. She has no lips to speak of. Two, turn the page and the after woman appears. She survives the hijacking of her heart. She is match lit. Her blush is the red of a bull's death. Her hair bounces back for more. She's been known to bite. Three, if you ask me what season I am, I would say late fall just at that time when trees give up and drop their leaves. My best colors are file cabinet, highway, Ohio. I wear them the way the wind wears what it passes. I like my meek mouth, my no grapes on the stem look. It makes me hireable. Four, but thank you for your day of beauty. If I change my skin, it'll be gradual the rest of my life. I'm going to read a three from here. Um, this one was prompted by a long time ago. I took a law and ethics class, and it was a class on pro-life. And this is going back in the 80s, but the, the main argument to be pro-life was what if you destroyed that life and that life could have been a famous violinist? And I just remember thinking, but what if it wasn't a famous violinist? Does that change it? 
you know, it just seemed like such like, oh gosh, you know, could have been a famous violinist, darn, you know. So this is called um, Case Study. You are a woman carrying a fetus destined to become a famous violinist. And that should be reason enough, the study concludes, to admit life for what it is. A heartbeat set, allegro molto appassionato, translucent fingers already curled to hold a bow. Now, by contrast, imagine an accordion player attached to your umbilical cord. Simple sep, expanding and contracting his huge lung. Arms outstretched as if to hold the universe. Now that's personhood. No manicuring of nails, no receiving the elite, no ultrasonic notes so sweet no one dares breathe. Sep will come barreling out, squeezed into an already rotating world. Most of us got here that way, not because of talent, but strong-fisted, helmet first. Um, this poem pays tribute to my mother, whom I was very close to. And there is a story that precedes this um, that I absolutely have to tell. My mother um, resisted learning English. She still could barely speak English, even though she'd been in the country for 50 years. And when she was in her 70s, she did a lot of volunteer work for um, the Ukrainian Research Fund at Harvard University. And she called me up one day and she said um, in Ukrainian, you know, Zvinya, I've been asked a huge favor. There is a deacon who is leaving the university and they've asked me to say some words to honor him on his behalf. And you need to help me with my English. But I went to the library and I wrote down some things that were very intriguing to me. And I said to her, oh, yeah, okay, Shunya, like, what, what did you find? She said, I found some particular quotes by Henry Miller that appealed to me. And I said, oh, Henry Miller. I said, you know, Shunya, why don't you tell me what it is that Henry Miller said to you that you want to include as part of this evening? And she said, Shunya, he said something so beautiful. You must always give with your soul and you must always give with your heart. But it's also important to give head. <laughs> so that's sort of when the record goes, and I'm like, wait, stop the presses. And I said, I said to her, do you have any idea what giving head means? And she's like, yes, he's talking about sharing what's on your mind. I'm like, no, he's not. And I basically explain to her in Ukrainian what, uh, how, you know, what it meant. But then she told me that in my sloppier Ukrainian, what I had described to her was a military canteen. <laughs> so, so early lessons in translation. But this poem honors that moment, and it is called Giving Head. <laughs> when mother gave head, to her it meant sharing what's on your mind. Her English so broken, I could imagine the rubble, the few sealed mark jars in her throat's basement. She gave head to the gas station attendant who drew the dipstick checking its tip, to the priest who advised her life is a journey, his own worn shoes, a pair of oxen. She even gave head to women, to the cosmetician who listened, rotating her plexi case, lipsticks displayed in rows like bullets, who understood loneliness and stray hairs, each week offering my mother a new sliver of color to take home, twisting the tube erect, dragging it across her wrist. After a while, to whom or what hardly mattered, Stones, meadows, stray dogs all seemed to know her. Fog caressed her, the moon emptied its massive head like a bucket. Except her daughter. When she tried to give head to her daughter, 
I gave back part of it, the lip. I was steady as an executioner, demonstrating my own obscenities. After that, I don't know to what non-English speaking corner she sentenced herself. Her now barely visible hand waving to me, not so much a goodbye as a curse. Now, my mother was great. She basically told me, because when I read this years ago, when this first happened, it always got a huge laugh. And sometimes when my mother was in the audience, like some, you know, historian of like 12th century manuscripts, like turn around and wink at her or something. She was, she was a really good sport. She said, if you can get a good poem of it, I don't care what you write about me. <laughs> so, no, she was wonderful. I love her dearly and miss her. Um, I'm going to switch now to poems about the body. Um, this was my third book. It's called Except for One Obscene Brushstroke. And this book had a lot to do with just very carnal subject matter. And it was very freeing to me to write it. One of the things also that my mother said to me uh, in her broken English was, Svinia, never censor your ship. <laughs> Again. She missed that, but that said it stronger. So I let my ship sail on through, you know, proud Mary keeps on burning type of thing. Um, so I'm going to read two, um, two poems I have here. One is called Letter uh, to Myself. Once I confused my own hand with desire. Once I held it there until it promised love. It couldn't possibly get better until I realized I'd rather cry or take a long bath alone in the house. Doesn't it seem the more thoroughly we wash, the more we stink? Our bodies refuse to trade in their own damaged coats, that even a moment can take more than all we've got. As um, A new mother, I had, um, my son was my first child and my daughter my second. And um, I had one sister, so having a son was very, you know, very different experience for me. But with a daughter, because I'm female, you know, I started projecting a lot of things and worrying and hoping, oh my God, that she doesn't do this and she doesn't do that. You know, the boy's world was much more of a mystery to me. So I wrote this sort of long poem, well, it's two pages. Um, to my daughter, it's, call, it's called, I Hope My Daughter Doesn't. And it runs into the first um, couplet. I hope my daughter doesn't lock herself in her room with only a nightgown and black lace-up heels, listening to average white band, dreaming about how to make it to Studio 54 from Brunswick, Ohio, while outside fields turn glossy with ice, and in the next room, my father dying, promising after the morphine takes hold to wait for all of us somewhere in heaven. I hope my daughter doesn't become scared of birds, angry creatures of vast acres affordable on the outskirts of town, holding a metal trash can lid like a shield as they graze past her. I hope she realizes how quickly her two-cylinder tractor cuts the grass down, how her large concentric circles only get smaller. I hope, like me, she never ties the clothesline around her neck just to see what would happen, then jumps from a chair, wears the cut behind her left ear like her first real secret to bed for a week. I hope my daughter doesn't grow up thinking her body's childlike, except for one obscene breaststroke, that she'll pull her loved one closer eyes closed and will let stars be stars unnamed above their parked car. Who was the man disgruntled who jerked the car door open, pulled me out of the front seat, gun to my cheek, calling me Kathy? I hope she doesn't take on God too young like the one that caused the kitchen light switch to spark and catch the wallpaper on fire or sent down the small plane killing the last of the town's seamstresses, three red-headed sons, the two already dead, one to heroin, the other in a car accident, leaving her with an alcoholic husband, a sewing machine, and a recent litter of puppies to give away.
I hope I believe whatever my daughter tries to hand me. I hope my daughter doesn't grow up thinking she wants to stay for her mother to live forever and decides toward her own life to run away, but does it well. Not like a friend and I tried to once, dressed in short tank tops and cotton-flowered skirts, hitchhiking to Boulder, Colorado, pulling our skirts up high above our knees. One car stopped and pulled off the shoulder, the driver slowly putting his cigarette out as both of us turned toward each other, high-fiving in disbelief. Things like that, like hitchhiking and thinking it's funny to pose along the side of the highway, those certainly kept me up nights. You know, it's like, holy mackerel, hope she doesn't get into those kind of imaginations the way I did. Um, writing about, I was sort of in the thick of writing about the body and physical things when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And knock wood, I'm an eight-year survivor. Um, yeah, I feel really, really happy about that. Um, but in the process, I, I wrote Convertible Night Flurry of Stones, and it is really a journey about um, that experience from diagnosis through treatment, through recovery. And I spent a lot of time talking about this book in the creative writing um, class, and I won't duplicate it, but I was just saying how what was crit of critical importance to me was to allow in the process of the writing to have the journey transform me in a way that was healing to myself. And also to allow myself to acknowledge the different sides of my personality that came out. I was, you know, heroin, I was coward. I changed personalities as frequently as I switched wigs. And I had quite a lot of wigs, I was very vain. Um, and looked, I couldn't carry bald well <laughs> at all. And I was laughing at the earlier class saying that at one point going to Whole Foods, uh, one of the registered guys asked me if I was in a witness protection program. Because <laughs> I never look the same twice. But I, I'm going to read poems that sort of go from that moment of total fear to sort of play, not playing, it's not a good time, but playing within the parameters that were handed to me and then sort of coming out the other, other side. As an introduction, I'm going to read uh, the poem that I was actually awarded the Pushcart Prize for. It's called Nude Descending, and the inspiration was Marcel Duchamp's Cubist, Nude Descending a Staircase. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's the nude Cubist female form coming down a stairway so you get a sense of fragmentation that comes together as a whole through the motion. And I felt that that was sort of the movement and the energy going through this illness and the treatment. Um, so this is called New Descending. Be broken in bright light, a drain in your back, your body releasing its deepest red, a cardinal opening a wing within, halved, one side soft, the other a scar running like a railroad track up to your underarm where your life was spared. That open field of broken glass and bad boys who'd slit anyone's skin just for the thrill. Just as the doctor appeared, asked you to count backwards. Be shattered, walking the hospital corridor slowly as each nurse changes her face, name, smiles and pretends to know you. Be just at the top of God knows what list. Run a mirror, turn toward a mirror and see all fire. Know your name spills like coal. Be broken in your car, watch the light snowfall, gather on the car's hood, disappear. Dream of eating only air. Stand at the top of the stairs in light falling from the high window. Be fractured, discharged, come down lightly as the first snowfall. White points 
torches in your hands. So the thing about that was that even though it was a descent, it's sort of the reversal of the traditional notion of transcendence. And a lot of poems, poets, we were talking James Wright, who used darkening or twilight as being the, the, the point in which you move actually toward light. Um, and it's the time and place of great self-awareness. So moving, um, this poem is called The Radiologist. And it was basically, I spoke with the radiologist, um, you know, a couple of days afterwards, after they did the biopsy. And this literally was kind of our phone call. And I, the thing that, that um, kept playing in my head were these lines by Franz Kafka. So as we were having this conversation, it's almost like Kafka was interjecting. So this poem is structured in couplets, and the Kafka lines are the second one, and I'll try to break a little bit so you can, you know, you'll recognize Kafka in there. The radiologist. He calls again to confirm what's already been confirmed. You do not have to leave the room. Still, he's hungry for conversation, as if you'd become his friend. Remain standing in your place and listen. Over the stiff shot of bad news. You have to listen to him. Do not even listen. Simply wait. Fearful, he'll add centimeters to the tumor just to be safe. Do not even wait. But tonight, he wants you to know more. You're practically, be quiet, still, and solitary. Neighbors. And did I know, he continues, that the house, the world, will freely offer itself to you? With the 35 acres just off the town's most desirable street to be unmasked was his. Isn't it a coincidence that his daughter, too, it has no choice, is a writer? Only she's with a bigger New York City house. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Maybe I'd like to buy a signed copy of her book someday. You do not have to leave the room. Everything's blessed and enlarged in his family's life. Remain standing in your place and listen. His daughter's gratitude for wildflowers, the easy country, do not even listen, simply wait. She grew up in his immeasurable love for her. Do not even wait. And all I want to ask again is just how big and if he's completely certain. Be quiet, still, and solitary. But he's through talking and hangs up. The world will freely offer itself to you. If it wasn't for my love of God, his mud-soft meadows to be unmasked. I drive my green Ford through the doctor's brambles and dead ends. It has no choice. I'd find his blossoming daughter. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet and take her life. Um, something nice that happened um, when I was in surgery, I didn't realize my sister had gathered some friends, and at the hour of my surgery, she asked all of them to take a stone, and at that hour, wherever they were, to just take that stone, which symbolized the cancer, and throw it as far away from themselves as possible. So I thought that was really a, a beautiful gesture. This poem is called, I Wasn't Aware and it's for my sister Maria. Of friends, each who took a stone and threw it out as far as was possible, past a collapsed train of shopping carts, out of a car window, passing a freezing pond into nearby woods, across a neighbor's circular driveway, through a stop sign toward the ocean, past the sun-bleached, vacant lifeguard's chair, threw it out as far as was possible from me. 
Um, okay. True as they predict, you do lose your hair on chemotherapy. And um, I know for me it was, I fought, I had really long hair, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm not going to wear a short haircut, I'll just see what happens. Well, what happens is you start to lose it, and, and you kind of look like this doll that's just like you had everything plucked out except for a few hairs. So I did finally decide and go and um, see somebody, and they do the buzz cuts for the women. And, you know, she asked me to shut my eyes because it's very traumatic. But I thought, no, if I'm going to go through this, this must be the writer in me, I, I want to keep my eyes really open for all of it. And, you know, I thought, hey, it don't look so bad, you know, in a butch. But, um, um, of course, I had to write a poem about it, and it's called Losing My Hair. It fills my hand like a small animal, species unknown. I could name it, close my eyes, rub it gently against my face, tangled in my fingers, soft as silk from a cornfield. Look, look, I called to my husband, carrying it down the stairs. Not that I wasn't warned by doctors that one day I'd find it on my pillows, in the drain, on my plate, in my food. That morning it started to snow, nothing that covered the ground well enough. Black splintered branches strewn all over the yard, neither wind nor trees. I couldn't bear to wrap it in toilet paper, throw it out. So I carried some strands to the woods, spread them on the ground for the birds to lift into their nests. I placed some more strands in an empty hornet's nest, its gray center welcoming my hand. The hornets were gone, but the birds might come back. I wrapped the last few strands with some horsehair I kept, a few thick pieces of a black mane I pulled, riding once, out of fear. Donna, the hairstylist, turns on the electric clippers, says, "Hun, do me a favor and close your eyes. She's tall, heavy, sweet as sugar, hair a teased peroxide blonde beehive. Over the phone, she'd said not to worry about anything. They had wigs, and they could play with me. But the first wig makes me look like an airline ticketing agent. The second one drives a school bus. The third one, curling around my mouth, wants sex. That one couldn't be worn near an open oven door. The dark one, like my mother's hair, loves the rain, travels well in a small box. Donna says, try this human hair. It fits like a silk glove. But it's short, thick, oriental hair, a gold medalist figure skater's hair. Donna says the reason my complexion looks so sallow is because of all of the chemo, but I haven't started treatment yet. I leave the yellow of her fitting room, sweeping the floor around my chair, Donna says, after the eyelashes and eyebrows go, your eyes will need more bang. Is it hot in here or is it just me? I, I feel, you feel like I'm... I just, I hate to keep people in here like if they're melt, melting, but... Um, um, I'm going to read three more from this collection. This one is called um, Lava Lamp, and it was um, going around to malls. And do you know, are you familiar with, like, Spencer Gifts? That, that store that's got all those, like, lava lamps and weird things. Okay, that's basically where it's set. Thank you. Um, lava Lamp. 50, the ultimate F word to these punks pricing lava lamps and crossbones, confusing thick leather wristbands for passion's steel thorns. No one but me takes notice of the ease with which they assign death to their own idiosyncratic dark. 
My raw health, too, wears shark fin gelled hair, shabby, sexy, in a beanbag chair kind of way. An incense stick thread smoke aisles away from the wind up chattering teeth, not unlike the dentures my mother pulled from her mouth to startle my young children when she babysat once. Yesterday, my blood sweet string of mood lights abandoned me for a hung 100-watt bulb and flickering neon tongue, the new hardware of my dream basement, where a waterbed heaves welcome in wafts of watered-down beer. Pin our lips together, play my words backwards, see if they say I'm alive. Okay, um, two more, and then I'll wrap up with a few from the new collection. This one um, is called The Cop, and it has to do with, I was going to a nutritionist appointment, and I was pulled over for speeding, and it was devastating because I felt like everything else was already going wrong in my life, um, and now I'm being pulled over. I thought at least I could be punctual. That I can do. Um, so I got pulled over by this cop, and I had um, my red wig on that day. So this poem is about that, um, and it's called The Cop. I wasn't the sassy redhead he thought he pulled over, black framed designer sunglasses hiding the fire in her eyes, whose car he'd walked extra slow to, passenger window lowering as she turned to speak ice slipping from the safety glass as from a square fin, hiding deep inside the car door, smudgeless, ready to rise. He looked directly at my mouth to see what it might be, a warm, welcoming silence or a dog caught with a bone. But my lips are too thin, slightly purple like morning glories choking along their white line. His hands were large. He spread his legs, ripped the ticket out of his book as if he was about to strip and the ticket was the first accessory to go. No, I wasn't the woman he thought he pulled over, but a spinning, out of control strip show coming right back at him. I pulled off my wig, held it out to him like a scalp, a sacrifice, an enormous spider mashed on the dashboard Holy Jesus, he muttered, sorry, 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 stepping back from my car. He didn't know where to look, no eyelashes, no brows, no face to match the face on the driver's license, no deep sky blue backdrop curtain to highlight the eyes. My hands shook on the steering wheel. A woman can be dismantled, yet she moves or dies. The cop is thankful his kids or his wife are not me, this woman for whom he now wishes Godspeed toward her prayers or the mothership or the ocean's white lip. His large hand now holding back traffic as together we pull out, gravel kicking up from behind his tires, siren blasting birds like torn paper wavering in the air. By nightfall, I'll convince myself it is a gift. This life so thick it sticks deep in my throat, parched and yellowing, overgrown shoulder like weeds rippling throughout my body. The cop home and showered with a story to tell. His family gathered inside their dinner halo. One of the nicest moments I had in giving a reading with these poems was that afterwards, um, this man came up to me and he had tears in his eyes and he hugged me and he said, you know, my wife is a breast cancer survivor, he said, and I'm a cop. And I just, that just made my night. So I always end this book with this poem. It's sort of my prayer poem. It's called Good Cells. Make them as true as Father pointing to heaven, knowing he's left no one behind. Tenacious as my mother looking out a window at a lone resident tree, hand her a paintbrush. Let her drag its bristled hair across a white page. 
Let them carry my husband's snow-dampened wood, be the passing, flickering flashlight. Let them be my son and my daughter, the scent of white soap. Let them be my working dog, Laika, the flurry of stones as we walked. Let them sound for my sister, Monday's church bells, a piano's felt-covered hammers, her husband's throat, nine years cancer-free. Let them carry light suitcases to my nephew and niece in industrious cities where they may applaud fruit ripening on its table without its tree. All right, I'm going to finish up with um, three poems from my new manuscript. I think we're, I started at 710. I'm going to read, I'm trying to think. I think I'm going to just read two. Um, okay. These are shorter ones. Um, the new manuscript is called Silver Tone. I, I won't read the title poem because it's a rather long narrative poem, but um, I have a, a two quotes prefacing the manuscript. One is by Jack Gilbert, Music is the Memory of What Never Happened. And then um, the other one is, um, you never get tired of writing this about this, your parents. And um, that is, why it's really warm up here, um, by Robert Lowell. So the, the, some familiar subjects um, go run through. This, this poem is also about my daughter and um, middle school uh, cruelties. We've all survived them. Some, to some extent. Um, just a second. Yeah? Yes. Okay, just two from the new manuscript called Silver Tone, um, which is an acoustic guitar that my father used to play. Um, this poem is called Jesus Loves Fat People. Scrawled in pencil on my daughter's algebra book above a hand-drawn crucifix. The cross so deliberately and thickly drawn, it could have been pulled off the wall of some rustic pagan Roman Catholic church, leaving one of the stations unoccupied and suffer free. Tonight, my too thin daughter pushes her food away. Everything is either a vein or fat or a strand of hair clinging like a slack tourniquet. It wasn't that long ago that I weighed myself. My body disappeared, the softness my husband couldn't find, leaving his head on my shoulder, leaning his head on my shoulder, running his hand across my hips, sharp rims of a broken clay bowl. Our family is gnarled with branches, anemic and leafless, specks of filtered sun, bits of meals inhaled quickly, looking over one's shoulder until not eating felt released and air pure. Is this another lesson? I'll lie awake in bed wondering if she'll turn her stomach inside out to be rid of. Then swear she's not one of those girls whose damaged marked bodies rise up through their throats. I want to ask Jesus already erased. Um, the last poem is called Illegible Postcards. And um, it just briefly, my, when my sister and I were growing up, my parents kept a lot of postcards that we used to look at and play with because they were beautiful um, kind of post-war hand-painted postcards and written in beautiful, you know, um, Ukrainian. And we couldn't, we didn't really bother reading what was on it because the outside usually was very typical to have like a picture of like, you know, red polka dotted mushrooms dancing or something like uber cheerful or rainbows and people watering rainbows and stuff. And then after um, 
my mother passed away a few years ago, my sister and I were going through the things, we actually started to really look close at the postcards and the backs said things like, may God look over us or I hope I will see you again. I mean, there were these horrific, painful messages that we didn't, we didn't realize. We were now seeing it for the first time. Um, and looking very closely, it was written. So illegible postcards, and I'll end with this one. Bone were we once misread stone. Fear rather than dear. They dragged our neighbor outside, not we met our new neighbor, shared bread. Turned the cart over to a golden field, grain stalks clearly scripted against the sky. My family gathers around our own warmed loaf. A single white candle pierces the middle, drips long wax lace onto the small wheat hill. Was that tiny ink blot not before shot? Grandmother's feather-shaped eyes sweeping through foreign woods for her missing son? Dreams flowed loose, tore on brambly banks. In my father's handwriting, words spatter, rain steadily kicked us on the back of a hand-painted postcard where a skinny, knock-kneed boy clutches a wind-thrashed umbrella in one hand, tilts to the weight of a water pail in another. Fleeing, was this all my mother and father had time to write? Or standing here, all we could bear to read? We were carried. This morning, among flowers, we were married. Thank you. If you have any questions, if you haven't all like melted in your seats, <laughs> um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, if not. All right. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>